Artificial intelligence. It's the newest hot button topic in the business world, but you might be surprised to learn that many of us have been using AI in our workplaces for years, often without even realizing it. But now with household names like ChatGPT, Bard, and Google AI, artificial intelligence is taking center stage. In this episode, we're diving deep into the AI revolution and peeling back the layers to uncover how it's woven into the fabric of the business world. We're also going to try to predict what's on the horizon and how AI is set to reshape our work environments. We'll explore the ways AI is making our work smarter, more efficient, and more exciting. Today, I'm joined by Bernardo Tiburcio of DuPont and Patrick Callahan of Labware. Let's get into it. Welcome to Conversations with Kelly, where we take a deep dive into important topics at the forefront of the business community, and we're featuring the experts, our members. Today's episode is all about artificial intelligence, and with me at the table, I have Patrick Callahan, Director of Data Analytics at Labware, and Bernardo Tiburcio, Senior Director of Digital Innovation and Data Analytics at DuPont. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Agnes. I'm just going to start off by saying I know nothing about artificial intelligence. I'm afraid of chat GBT. So you guys are really going to help me learn today. <laughs> um, Patrick, why don't you just tell us first about yourself and what you do? Sure. Um, so um, being head of the um, analytics team, or like I said, for a global organization, it's with their software. So Labware, if many people don't know, is they collect the samples. It's a lab information management system. So you can collect samples from all the labs in the world. And you can think of um, all the pharmaceuticals. Um, if you think of anything on this table that needs to be tested in some form or another, then we do um, the testing of samples. So the analytics portion is trying to predict things on this samples or mm-hmm. discover new things on the samples or um, help our scientists get closer to new discoveries on the samples. So that's what the data science team does there. And how big is your team? They have about 15 people on our team. It was um, through an acquisition of a company that started um, called Compass Red, and Compass Red was a data science organization, like an ad agency almost. Mm-hmm. But um, we focused on instead of having creatives doing designs, we'd have data scientists doing things that are creative with data. Very cool. Do the customer. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Is that how you two know each other? Yeah, pretty much so. And then I think um, just being Delaware, like um, as we start to talk about or um, really push the idea of the impact of data science has on around people's lives. I, Bernardo and I like, cross paths so much. So, yeah. Bernardo, tell us about yourselves. Sure. Um, so I've been with DuPont for about 21 years now. And for the last five years, my task has actually bring the digital transformation to the company. And the way we interpret that in DuPont is to bring emerging technologies, things like artificial intelligence, advanced analytics, virtual reality, all that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. um, in a practical way that will deliver value to the organization and to the businesses. And as you can imagine, um, artificial intelligence specifically has been at the center of what we do for at least the last five years. Okay. Starting pretty much looking into the the, the capability of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning models to t- do predictions to help the business either to make predictive maintenance or predictive quality, predictive yield. And for the last few months, um, we are all about generative AI and, and looking for applications for that as well. Very, very cool. Uh, and I th- you probably, you're both really ahead of the curve, I think, when it comes to AI. It's you know, really now just popping up all over the place. It's like the new buzzword. Everyone's talking about AI, but it's such a surface level knowledge at this point. And it, I think it really is based around the, the generative piece, the chat GDP, the the bar, the Google AIs. Um, but I know it's so much more than that. So can you just tell me what is artificial intelligence and what does that definition entail? Wow. And it is a big, <laughs> really big question. No, that that that, that is great, and and, and it sometimes it's very difficult to to explain because there are so many parts of it. Right, and I think it's still being defined. It's, it's still, still being defined. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the, the interesting part is not new at all. Mm-hmm. Like I actually I took a course on on artificial intelligence when I was in college, and let me tell you, that's decades ago. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you exactly how long. But um, this is artificial intelligence is about programming and designing computer systems to emulate how humans do work, how humans think, how humans act. Um, And because of that, it actually takes a lot of different 
parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think as you say, say we, we are actually in a constant evolution of, of, of the application of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So once you crack the code, you got to completely reinvent it the next day. Exactly. And, and it has evolved from, from early studies of artificial intelligence where um, some of the areas of knowledge were about the expert systems to um, neural networks not that now because of the capability of, of the computers today right. are actually able to do very amazing things beyond even predicting, now even generating and being in quotes, creative. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think you nailed it. I think um, the way I kind of think, and, and I always say that I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, I hire the smartest people in the world, and that's uh, that's what helps. Um, so being the dumbest is great, but that means I can explain some things too. And the way I kind of look at it is, we're given numbers as a human, right? We look at these things and we extrapolate, and we use our intelligence to say, this is this is what the numbers are telling me. Let's let's make this action mm -hmm. kind of thing. What's happened over the last twenty years that Bernard has said it was this is not something that was new. But we've gotten more data. So so much data through websites, through all that kind of thing, through through interactions of humans. Um, and then technology has made it faster. So we get all this data that a human can't comprehend, and there's all this technology that never existed before to make things instantaneous mm -hmm. that becomes what artificial intelligence is based off of so it's using math to help predict things to make decisions um so that in and as you point out there's really two types there's that type of ai then there's degenerative ai mm -hmm. so the previous one where we're using math and numbers people are using this in their everyday lives and just don't know it Right, so that was going to be one of my questions. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, to go in, I, I, I can think of a billion different uh, the thermometer on a wall is now electronic, mm -hmm. and they predict, oh, they're coming home. So they're using artificial intelligence to help heat the room or air condition the room, or on your iPhone, right? you pull up in something that says, hey, I'm predicting it's eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're probably going to listen to podcasts on your way in. So it's going to show that at first instead of one I've never used before. Every time I get in my car in the morning, it tells me how long it's going to take to get to work. And I'm like, how did you know I was going there? Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, and we all think, oh, there's some big thing in the world that's looking, hearing the words I'm saying. Well, there actually is. It's called a computer, and it's taking the data from that you've submitted into your phone and then putting that out there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and and then it gets even more complicated than that. Like it becomes as applied to like in healthcare, like there's so much data that a doctor can't comprehend. Like 30 years ago, there were 40, four different types of blood problems. Now there's 896. My daughter's a med school, so there's no way that she can memorize all that stuff. So we take all the data from our healthcare, we put it in and the machine helps say, well, it might be this problem that you're having to think. And so it gets applied in so many different ways in, in all our work that you don't even know. When you do autocorrect, someone could argue that that's as a form of predicting what you're saying. It's a form of artificial intelligence. Very interesting. And Oh, go ahead, Bernardo. Yeah, no, it's a great point because access to that large amount of data, like many years of historical data is super important for the ability of artificial intelligence to do predictions and give you things like that because that's how those artificial intelligence machine learning models work. Mm -hmm. they, they, the way they are able to do predictions in a lot of different ways is by looking at whatever happened in the past. The largest the data set, the, the biggest the information is that you have, the more accurate you can be on some of those predictions. Mm -hmm. And just think about it, like with mobile devices and, and, and just our ways of living these days, we are generating like, megabytes of data every day with everything that we do from driving, mm -hmm. watching a movie or computer, from going to work, like all of that is generating data that then can be used to create. Data. Yeah, to help us learn. Um, the Chamber, we're a 10-person nonprofit. We're small, um, but I like to say we're also mighty. Um, but we are, we recognize that data is so important to helping a business be better. Um, but so often, I mean, I'm, again, I'm speaking for myself, but also on behalf of a lot of our small business members, we don't know where to start and we don't know, we, we don't have the skills to take all this data that we know we have and figure out how to find answers. And it's also really intimidating. Um, I have to give a shout out to Ryan Harrington at the 
the data innovation lab, he's helped us with our intern Delaware program, um, collecting the information so that we can understand, um, for example, if an intern attends more than two events during the, the program, they're more likely to change their opinion on, on the state of Delaware and um, are more likely to like the state of Delaware. And those are things that we're now learning, but gosh, had we not had the help um, to start figuring out how to take that data and find that information, uh, we never would have been able to tell that story. So how can a small business like dip their toes into this water? Right. And, um, I'll, I'll give a shout out if I, right. The, um, the, the first, like it, again, talked about non-generative stuff. And I think we should talk about that a little differently, like it, uh, because that's super important. We should ded dedicate some time to that. Um, there used to be, you used to have to hire a technologist and a data scientist to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. But now these tools like Excel and um, the, the next predecessor BI tool, business intelligence tools, are allowing you to ask questions um, and look at predictions. So mm -hmm. take the data down, put it into a spreadsheet or a database, and then predict things. And it'll help you figure out this. So even that simple thing, or even your finances and QuickBooks is starting to, to um, you can look for artificial intelligence or questions that mm -hmm. have been asked to help you figure these things out. Um, when we start with relating generative by eye, that's a whole other thing that will will help address a lot of the questions you're asking too. And, and the small business side, I don't know if you want to. I mean, let's go there then. Tell, okay. me, tell me about it. So, well, the, Patrick is absolutely right. The, the, it's, it's kind of exponentially how fast companies, software developers are embedding artificial intelligence into their offerings. Mm -hmm. So very fast, you are going to be able to use, anybody is going to be able to use one of these capabilities in your regular tools. Like yeah. actually was mentioning in Excel or in your accounting system or in any database that, that you use over there. Like they are bringing really these capabilities. One of the reasons, I believe, why generative AI has um, become such a, a must word lately and everything is how accessible it was because of the open AI chat GPT solution, how accessible it became, right? So you know when that I, I learned about chat GPT for my kids, they were using it. Like, Are you know, I didn't have to do their homework. Yeah. I did like, what? Then they take a look at that stuff. So, so it's, it's become so easy to adopt, so easy to use and so practical uses yeah. that, that, that now people can use it in, in their everyday life. Yeah. This GPT stuff is, is fascinating. Um, the way I kind of see it developed was it's basically taking the math that we talked about, the predictions mm -hmm. and incorporating something called natural language processing. So it's understanding a human's voice and able to process that information into a question. And so that's where it all started to take off, right? And then be, and then you know, lots of money, lots of data, lots of technology and processing power made it very much easier to understand a human and then what the possible response would be for that human question. Are there any dangers in all of this, you know, caution to the wind when you're deciding yeah. to embrace this sort of stuff? And I'll give an example. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of People talk about how this can help you, you know, write an article or um, help with grant writing, and that's great. It makes your life easier, but it, it's not perfect. So, what what are some of the the things people need to just be careful of? I I kind of start, and then I'll share a little bit about our approach you know, in the point of how we are yeah. embracing uh, generative AI and all of the productivity and the efficiencies that we can gain with adopting this technology, but at the same time being very, very careful about all of the risks that, that, that come with this technology, right? So in our approach is always balancing these offense and defense. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with the defense part, right? Like, like you ask about some of the risks. The nature of the how generative AI works um, it's, it's, it's basically all based on statistics, right? Is the, the, the foundation, the foundational point is something called large language model. Mm -hmm. So basically is you train these models to, to process the input in, in regular language 
and access knowledge through these models that basically what they do is they use the statistics to predict what the following word will be based on some context. Mm -hmm. So one way to, to, to think about it is if you if you have your, your cell phone and you're sending a text message, do you see like sometimes it's telling you what's the next word that I you might be able off. to use? <laughs> Well, just imagine, that, like your phone is able to do that with a kind of good enough data set of what you've been texting and then probably something from other people that is using that text. The large language model that is used for, for the chat GPT, for example, use trillions of, of data points available in the internet to create those models. Mm -hmm. So it creates all of that based on statistics. So if the model is predicting the next word and can't even create like stories or songs or like everything, the fact that it's very creative is also a, a risk, mm -hmm. right? Because they, these models tend to, they call it hallucinate. They are very good at answering questions and make you feel that it's actually factually true. Mm. When it's not, it's like, it's like they are just statistically making conversations. Right, it's essentially a guess. <laughs> So we basically look at three things, call it the ABCs. You need to be very careful when you are using this technology about accuracy, right? So, so always put an expert in front of that. You, you cannot just assume that whatever you're getting is true, even though it might sound good. The B is bias. Again, because it's based on the statistics, you, this thing can, can be very biased if you are asking questions. For right. example, to read these 10 resumes and pick me whether you're the best person for this job. You need to be very careful about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the third one is completeness. Is Again, it's based on a statistics, so it's basically showing you the most statistically relevant and important things, but it's not complete. It doesn't have the full picture. That's where you need experts and humans interacting with this technology. Right. So it's still going to be super important to keep getting value from it. I like that, ADCs. That's good. I think, um, I, I, just to underscore a few of those, I, I think of this two things, facts and believability. So the dangers are that um, most of the things, like Fernando said, like you, you have to check the facts that it puts out in front of you. Um, the believability, I'm sure we all heard, the, or maybe some did, but the, uh, the story of the New York Times uh, reporter having a conversation with our early days of Chabby to you that didn't have any um, limitations to it. And it was trying to convince him to leave his wife. And it was very, very convincing. Like, well, here's five reasons why you should, or, you know, those kind of things. And um, so the, the problem is that like a uncontrolled model that could get out there. And like we saw in the elections before, like, are these facts true? That type of thing. It could potentially show something visually, like a picture or even textually uh, a story that may not be true, but it looks so believable. Because you're asking it, can you trick a human? And it's saying, yes, I'll try to find out the best thing to trick a human. Mm -hmm. So that, those two things to me are the biggest things that um, we have to be worried about or aware of. Is there, if you were um, a small business owner or running a nonprofit, what advice would you give them to, again, get started in this to effectively help their company? Yeah. Well, let me, let me start again. It always balances the offense and defense. This is a great technology. So, so by all means, I'm not recommending that you stay away from there, right? It's, you, need, you need to embrace it because right. it's going to be a competitive advantage going forward. It's going to help a lot in productivity, like the, to accelerate your go-to-market strategies. Like a, it's, it's super important. But yeah, you need to be careful about these things. And, and especially if you're a business, uh, something that is very important is also take Think about intellectual property. Uh, if you are using public models over there, like ChatGPT, for example, or if you are using um, Google Bard or the Bing um, chat solution, right? Everything that you put in there is basically you're giving it to the model and the company decides if they can use that information to train the model further. So for example, if you, if you are trying to, oh, I just need to translate this patent document in Chinese before I submit it. And you're basically just, and that's intellectual property, that's confidential, you put it over there. It's, it's like it's that you like, actually handed that document uh, to OpenAI or whoever, and, and then they, you don't know how careful they are gonna be with that. So, so you need to be super careful about intellectual property. 
And then besides the ABCs that I talked to you about, the, the, the other part that is important is the workforce implications, right? Is It's not only about you understanding the technology and how it can bring productivity, is how do you prepare all your organization with the right knowledge, skills, structuring the organization in the right way to take advantage of this technology. Well, you make a great point about workforce being prepared for it. Um, but I think there's also a lot that's out there about that it's replacing the workforce. Agree, disagree? I disagree. I think, um, and I'm an optimist, I think, um, I think it's actually going to enhance it. Um, there, in fact, there was a, a study that just came out this way. Like, it's crazy how, how quick this stuff is changing. I mean, literally, even this morning, there were a whole bunch of releases that are changing its trajectory. Mm -hmm. But they talked about how BCG, the off the consultant group, um, like they they allowed the consultants to leverage ChatGPT for certain tasks, and it was upscaling their productivity. The the information that they were like using like significantly, like forty percent in some cases. Um, I think of it as like a uh, someone who used the word cyborg. It's it's a second brain or something that you can bounce ideas off mm -hmm. of. And so I, I don't see that as replacing people, maybe some knowledge workers, which we always thought might be the other end of the spectrum. But it's um, I do think this is this could potentially create more jobs mm -hmm. um, than as, as opposed to it. So I, I I just don't see it. Um, I'm sure there's arguments for it. Yeah. I don't know how you feel. I, I think it's uh, I think in, in general I agree with that because we've seen this happening before when the internet came when mobile. I was gonna say I feel like the same fears when when technology was really coming into the scene. Yeah, and even during the industrial revolution. Yeah, right. Like like you have machines and everything, so it it will have an impact on and it will potentially transform some jobs just yeah. because how prevalent is this this in all kind of conversations in professional settings pretty much everywhere you go if you if you go to a i, I have conversations with our chief procurement officer for example that he goes to a procurement meeting with all different people from the industry they have a lot of conversation about generative ai you talk to scientists and then they are talking about that stuff so so just stick within your own peer groups and, and professional groups, the right avenues to talk, because that for me, that's that's what it really makes it real, mm -hmm. right? Is, is what talking, uh, what what are you doing and what did you learn? Yeah. And so those kind of things are super valuable for us. Too. I am mistaken for you. If we were to see where, where are we today, right? I love this article on the New York Times. I don't know, it was one reporter, the hard fork or something, you were listening to that podcast. Um, and they, they compared it to alchemy before chemistry. And in alchemy, like you get all these different formulations and no one knows what this stuff is or type of thing. I really think we're in the industry. We have no idea where this is going. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it'll read the the dupop from the, the next, um, the chemical, you know, and how that, should, look how that changed our lives. So we're in these early days, but um, it's really impactful even today. I just learned so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to transition to our, our combo connection where we give a shout out to a business, a person in the community, someone that just deserves a, a kudos or a shout out. Bernardo, I'll let you go first. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to I wanna give a, a shout out to my team. They, they, our digital team in, in, in DuPont is how we internally brand our digital innovation technology organization. And they, they just jump into this thing so fast. Like because of those risks that I was telling you, the team within a month, like in less than a month, were able to create an internal version of a chat GPT that people inside the company can could use securely. And now we have over 2,500 users registered with that application getting value out of it. And, and, and now we feel comfortable that that's in a safe way. Yeah. So the team jumped on it and, 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 and just Amazing! I'm very proud of how how my team is doing. That's great, Patrick. So, um, uh, my favorite uh, person that needs a co yeah, I'll this person, but Mike Bowman here um, at the I, he's in everything that I know of. But a lot of the building we're sitting in right now, a year ago, I came up here and there was no walls. I was wearing a hard hat, and it was uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. But um, 
my first company, I knew mean, he's the connector. He's that one person who's a visionary, who saw this campus here and has helped invest and build it, the building that we're in, but a constant change agent that's like the biggest cheerleader for new innovations and people just getting started. So if you don't know Mike Bowman, you show that he is a gift to our, our, our state, our region, um, the Delaware small business community. Um, so I will all on that and I, I would agree on, on the statement of visionary. That's a good shout out. Um, mine, I will, I'll shout out to Delaware bio. Um, since we're, we're recording this podcast in the Delaware data innovation hub, they're a member and a partner of ours. So I'll say hello from a, a couple floors up above them. Um, before I let you guys go, uh, Bernardo, how can people reach you if they'd like to get in touch with you after this? I guess the easiest way will be through LinkedIn. Um, so, so yeah, you can find like, the good news is there is not a lot of people named Bernardo Tiburcio. So they'll find you very so easily. There's a lot of people called Patrick Callahan, unfortunately. <laughs> We're yeah. technically in uh, the other Patrick, Patrick Callahan's yeah. office. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the big difference between him and I is that in, we both had beards at one point, but um, <laughs> uh, that he has an I in his name and I do not. So um, it's Patrick dot callahan c-a-l-l-a-h-a-n at loudware.com feel free to reach out to me there um yeah that's the best place to get hold of me great and if you'd like to get in touch with me or anyone at the chamber um you can find our contact information on our website www.dscc.com you can interact with us on social media we're on facebook twitter linkedin youtube and very recently instagram very exciting um, thank you both so much for joining me for this conversation. I, I really appreciated it. And I, I hope people come away with a couple notes and to do's to, to help them understand AI a little bit better. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Great to know about that too. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll see you again. Then, yeah. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Conversations with Kelly, brought to you by the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce. Our thanks as always to our production partners at Short Order Production House, a bowstring company. And before we sign off, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening. I know podcast hosts say this all the time, but your support is invaluable and it helps other listeners find us easily. I'm your host, Kelly Basil. We'll see you soon.